Candy's pretty interesting culturally in the late 60s because the book was written in 1958. By the time it was made into this film, the book was notorious. Even if people don't like the movie in terms of how it relates to the book and they think the book is superior, the movie, just by its virtue of how it was made, it works. Yes, indeed. You didn't hear the question. Is that right? Yes, Daddy. What? Yes, Mr. Christian. All right. Now I think we're getting somewhere. It is a chaotic movie, and I think people think it's a mess. There were a lot of critics that didn't like it when it came out. Pauline Kael didn't like it. She hated it. Renata Adler didn't like it. The one critic that did like it was Roger Ebert, but that doesn't surprise me since he wrote Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. But uh, it is, it's a chaotic movie and I, it's supposed to be. The criticisms that it doesn't work or doesn't gel together, it kind of isn't supposed to. I mean, in the way, in whatever way people are wanting. I think it's different now when we watch it though than when it came out, because when it came out, again, the book was so famous that People were comparing it to the book, and and because uh, people read that back then, they actually read books. <laughs> the, the the book has a really interesting history in terms of it being all the different publishers that it went through. It started as a under a pseudonym as a pornographic novel, and then it got really popular, and they had to really fight to get rights issues and all these things. So it was already this huge mess and people were suing each other and all this so that by the time it gets to the movie i think they felt like everyone again wanted a piece of this and now these guys are coming in they were unhappy well i know that terry southern was unhappy with casting Ooh allen because he thought it should be an american girl i am candy candy christian candy beautiful name it has the spirit the sound of the old testament thank you mm. Ooh allen is right for the movie. I disagree with uh, those that don't think she is or that maybe she's flat. But there's nothing wrong with me. I don't think that's for you to say, is it? Well, she's dubbed because she's Swedish and it works because there's this sort of otherworldly quality to her while looking like this pure, innocent, beautiful girl. She also has this sort of spaced out, naive, unique look. I, no one looks like her. Mephisto! Richard Burton is perfectly cast in this. I love his character, McFeesto. It's one of the highlights of the movie is when he goes in and recites his poetry in his purple scarf with, you know, the big grand entrance into the classroom and how silly that all is. He had just done Boom that same year, which I'm sure he didn't realize how Boom would be. Uh, I love Boom, but you know, the, a lot of people think it's just this campy disaster. I think it's a great movie, but... Um, General, please. I'll do anything. It's just, you know, all of these guys, they're kind of tweaking their personas in this. And then also, you just get the feeling that they just want to be in the company of this swinging movie. What is your name? Candy. Candy, how do you spell it? C-A-N-D-Y. Brando later reflected that he was not happy with his performance. I think he's really funny in it too, but he, he was not, he was embarrassed. You're my brother. You tell me, where did I go wrong? Well, tell me. You know, you know what your problem is? You're not getting enough yourself. John Aston has one of the best performances in the film, and it makes you wish John Aston had done more roles like this or had been in more films, and not just known as Gomez Adams. He's the square father of Candy Christian, the high school teacher, and then he's the swinging, rather perverse uncle. Oh, come on, you can't fool around with people's bodies all day long and then pretend you don't know the score. That's the one, she's the troublemaker. I mean, you could say this in a really simplistic way, but it's like, you know, what men are. And they're like the two halves of, you know, <laughs> one side is a lechy uncle, one side is the upstanding father. And it's a constant battle. Oh, yeah. They say in my country that the centipede has a thousand legs, but he cannot tap dance. I don't quite see the connection. Well, it loses a little something in the translation. 
for these guys, these actors, they'd seen it all. But if you think about your father during that time and how he would have looked at that girl walking down the street in that mini dress, what is he thinking? He'd not seen that in the 50s. He'd not seen that in the early 60s. Those girls walking around and, you know, it creates obviously lustful thoughts, but even things that might disturb you. That's why Pretty Maids All in a Robe, made by Christian Marcon's great friend, Roger Vadim, is also in a similar vein because it's about a guy that's staring at all these beautiful girls and he gets murderous thoughts. But it's interesting because you could look at it from a feminist standpoint and find something negative about it. But I actually think they're showing how absurd these men are in their quest for, for getting laid. Viva Zapata! At the time, you know, I think some people thought it was flat and silly and maybe we're more square now. I don't know. Maybe people were a little more in tune then because now when you watch it, it seems bizarre and outrageous in a good way, not just in a sloppy way, but also quaint. Also a little bit dark, but uh, that seems like such a duality that I'm saying there that is both, but it is encompassing both to me. So it's hard to describe, it's hard to articulate simply, and that's why I think people just see it as a mess. But there's definitely something there that's coming through that says something about the time that makes you kind of want to go back and live in it, and then kind of not. This has got to stop! Oh, come on, loosen up. Where's that old sense of humanity? I love this movie. At the time, it was unfairly maligned. I think that it's a really interesting look at the 60s and what was going on, not only in the culture, but also in the film business. And then it's just fun to watch. It's a really sexy movie. It has this mysterious essence to it that I cannot quite pull out exactly what it is because it's a sort of darkness and a light and I don't know if it's the what was happening while they were making film bleeding into the film and then the actual creators the original creators don't like this movie so you know there's that negativity going on yet at the same time and then who Allen seems like she could either be enjoying herself and just be not having fun at all running away from all these men and it all combines into this movie so there's a sort of uh if you the sexuality of it is complicated, as silly as it all is, because sex is complicated, it is absurd, it's bizarre, it can also be banal, which it's making fun of too. So there's all these different things about the movie that whether or not you find it good, and I don't even think that's the right way to look at it, just is this a good movie? That doesn't really matter. I think you just watch it for the experience. This is absurd. This is the 20th century. We're in the Midwest. It is kind of like hearing about someone's crazy sex life and uh, also how silly it is or maybe not even believing it. I don't know. There, it, there's, so, there's, you know, the whole movie's like an unreliable narrator. Ooh. Well, I'll tell you when to say who. Again, for this movie that's considered so silly and these some of these critics just wrote off as stupid, it is complex. It's hard to distill and into one thing. And that speaks well of it because that makes it timeless.